Atlanta, Georgia, home of the civil rights movement and leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, Zerona Clayton, and the headquarters of the modern day leaders like Stacey Abrams and Latasha Brown. The work of these organizers helped secure democracy and progress, not only in the state of Georgia, but the United States and the larger democratic world. But we're living in different times, people. We are in the face of contentious elections, extreme divisions growing between political parties, and the rise of modern day voter suppression efforts. So young activists are losing faith in the system, causing them to look for ways to drive change outside of the ballot box. I feel like when MLK's movement kind of uh, ended and subsided, our parents and that generation were very comfortable and very okay with the rights that they received after you know the civil rights movement. However, they started to have kids, they started to have us, and we began to be brought up in the backdrop of Trayvon Martin and uh, a lot of just, um, there's so many names that I could rattle off. The American people who are here have had a long plight, you know, fighting for basic things. A lot of that legacy actually started here in the South. And so there's a rich history of resistance in the U.S. to fight for basic democratic rights, but it hasn't been sustained. And I think that here we don't have a unified vision of what democracy looks like. 50 years after the civil rights movement, the latest generations of organizers are still living the legacy of their forefathers as they dedicate their lives to advancing democracy for all. But unlike many civil rights trailblazers who strive to secure the vote, this new generation is looking elsewhere. They're not putting up with America's shit. I have beef with American democracy. My personal relationship to American democracy has been um, severed, if you will. I think democracy is born out of the needs, desires, and wants of a community. It doesn't work when people get apathetic. Having collective decision making that represents the majority of people and their needs, but also ensuring that the systems that are in place that are hindering democracy, you know, are transformed. We have to really protect our vote. We have to speak on the issues that we find important. Um, really do the research and the work and knowing that it's a movement, not a moment. The people are deciding the vote. The people are deciding how things work. That's how democracy works. But then you look at America, where is this happening? Or you look at the fact that I live in Georgia and I'm looking at people's rights to vote being taken away and I'm sitting here like, where is this thing called democracy? I would define democracy as evolving. Unsustained. Unrealistic. Great in theory. In many ways outdated. Power to the people. We are a third world country in a Gucci belt. My name is Diamond Bradley. I am from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'm the founder of the primary movement here in Atlanta, Georgia. I identify myself as a historian and a curator. Um, so I like to combine art and history together in my programming um, and in my art activations. When I produce or curate shows or programming, I really try to make sure that people leave with a fact or a story that they didn't know before to provide that to their community and to their you know, friend groups. I think art has always been involved in social movements. With the civil rights movement, the We Shall Overcome, like that banner, that's art the signs that they were gonna protest, like I am a man, or you know, just things like that. That was a form of art and a form of resistance. I think it's the artist's responsibility to reflect the times, and that's like a quote from Nina Simone. Using that in social movements can really impact our community. And I really do see organizing and the roles of organizers is connecting your personal journey um, but connecting your gifts to the work that you do. An artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. I think that is true of, of, of painters, sculptors, poets, musicians. I, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's their choice. But I choose to reflect the times and the situations in which I find myself. That to me is my duty. We work together with Pratt Pullman Yards to reflect and honor the life of A. Philip Randolph and the Pullman Porters. A. Philip Randolph 
was a leader and a voice for the Pullman Porters to have higher wages um, as their white counterparts during the time of segregation. That's right, A. Philip Randolph is a legend. The Pullman Porters were the very first African-American labor unions to sign a collective bargaining agreement with a major U.S. corporation. Randolph helped to bring economic stability and honor to the occupation by exercising his rights and motivating others to do the same. But what is a union? So a union is when workers form an organization using their voices to better represent themselves, get better rights, better wages, an overall safer workplace. So the labor movement is all these different jobs together forming unions and pushing for unions for all workers across America. It's been statistically proven that people in a union make 26% more money than those who are not in a union. So you're getting better wages, you're getting better benefits. You feel heard, you feel like you're represented in your workplace. When people ask to define Labor Day, they assume it's for veterans or it's for the military or it's just some random federal holiday. Wait, Labor Day? Unions, they're connected? Yeah. Labor Day is observed the first Monday in September and is an annual celebration of the social and economic achievements of American workers. The holiday is rooted in the late 19th century, where labor activists pushed for federal holidays to recognize the many contributions American workers have made to America's strength, prosperity, and well-being. Even then, working class citizens saw it was necessary to look upon themselves to organize and enact democracy outside of a traditional ballot box. I am tackling climate change outside of typical democratic methods in the way that I am because I think there are often ways that our government still shows us that our votes don't always matter. Um, and outside of what they do, there's still work to be done. There's still activism to be made. And I also know that there's a lot of people who feel like me as well. And by coming and just being like, yeah, you need to vote in X, Y, and Z in my suit and tie, I wasn't going to get the community that I wanted to get activated. While we're in an area of a climate crisis, a position where we need a lot of people to get very interested and very involved, also very soon, I never thought that these fear-based tactics, as well as just um, typical literature and just having to read about it, would just be something that would really, one, get people excited, but also, two, a great way to take in a lot of information. I like to take a more positive and creative approach to get people excited and to really warm the hearts and then like also to make it tasty and digestible to take in that information. A lot of minority-based areas tend to suffer the worst consequences of environmental impacts. So often our affordable housing and stuff like that is located around toxic waste sites, a lot of pollution, air pollution, noise pollution, food deserts. Environmental racism exists today due to historical redlining, property devaluing, and segregation in the U.S. Many black homeowners and renters had no choice but to move into polluted environments and often did not even know of these issues until it was too late. Solutions outside of the ballot box kind of have to go hand in hand with, you know, educating people on voting and their rights to vote. Um, but once you do that, you kind of have to filter people to different areas of work that's going on and educate them on the different aspects of, you know, this movement and recognize that voting is just one aspect that you can be involved in, in terms of creating change. How I would describe abolition is being open to what is not currently here, what systems could be in place that are different from what we have now. An abolitionist is someone that is continuously stretching their mind and continuously um, dismantling what they think they know and continuously learning, you know, more information. When you look back on history, you have more of a refined lens to look through. Um, and oftentimes while you're kind of living through history, um, society in and of itself just doesn't take the position that is historical. Society was not for the abolition of, of slavery because it was such the driving force of the South's economy. So during the time, of course, everyone was looking at slavery as this thing that you can't get rid of or that was impossible to abolish. 150 years later, you know, society has this 
view that, yeah, slavery is horrible. Slavery is a human rights violation, et cetera, et cetera. But during that time, that's not, it wasn't looked at like that. So it's kind of the same thing when you talk about the abolition of the police force or the abolition of democracy as we know it today. People just can't fathom it. People can't see it. You know, we need the police. Who am I going to call when somebody robs my house or when somebody, you know, just does something unthinkable. The first thing that you're going to think of is calling the police. However, I truly believe, you know, maybe 50, 100 years from now, when that work has, you know, progressed to building different systems that lessen our reliance on the police force, people are going to look back and say that, you know, that was something that was a human rights violation. It is no secret that human rights violations have sparked many groups of people to form and make changes as they see fit, instead of relying on those in power. Some see activism as a method to change or influence politics, while others seek to make the change themselves. This mindset is especially important for those that serve those whose needs can't wait for an election and communities that don't fit neatly under the democratic umbrella. So the community fridge um, serves to be a no barriers to entry kind of opportunity for people to put in or take out food at any time. Um, and this is without any surveillance, without any permission or anything like that. So it's meant to destigmatize food insecurity because at any point um, you can put in something or you can take out something with anybody else knowing. The reason why we started a community fridge is because we wanted to focus on the idea of mutual aid. Um, so when we do food drives or promote any kind of like charitable or or philanthropic um, kind of effort, it feels less like you're connecting with your community because the, the very essence of mutual aid is about understanding the needs of your community members instead of assuming any kind of like class superiority. I care because it, the only thing that makes sense to do is care. Once I connected with an issue and I was able to see how deprived, especially communities in Atlanta were, it didn't make sense for me to turn away and pretend that I hadn't seen it. I found myself um, kind of in a compromising position because I thought a vote was the ultimate solution. It takes some time for policy to go through. And because we're in constant kind of political gridlock, it's hard for our community members to see the immediate return, um, especially on their vote. It's like imperative for us to remain connected to our needs, even when we're not voting, because if we're no longer paying attention when we're not voting, then we've kind of been pacified by a process. Government was built to move slowly. It maintains stability and predictability, which in many cases is a good thing. But this practice of incremental change often leaves many people waiting their entire lives for the resources they need. This is where community-based organizers come in. The people who don't wait for an election, a bill, or a ruling, but struggle to fill the needs today. It's important that we don't just fight for a future that we do not see, but we also act in the present we were given. After COVID <laughs> happened, there was like a big shift, I think, in my politics um, because I just saw how you know, communities were like directly impacted just by not having like housing, not having, you know, rent covered and like how that particularly affected migrants. Migrants um, are not seen in the vision of American democracy. So for a lot of migrants, you know, strive for the American dream. And what does the American dream encompass? They want housing, they want education, they want social services, but when they come here, they realize they don't get those things. And so for migrant communities, um, I think it's about how we can unite what the vision is for migrant communities with the vision that people have here in the U.S. of a democracy, which to me would look like making sure everyone's like needs are fulfilled and that we actually have a system where people can participate in. I'm only here because of policies that were created in the Philippines that were also sustained because of U.S. imperialism. And for a lot of Filipinos, even if that connection isn't as clear, it's still there. Our moms are nurses. Our parents, you know, work in some sort of health care. That's not, that didn't fall from the sky. That's intentional. There are systems in place to ensure that. Activists have long understood the truth that progress is not bound within the borders of a nation, but rather a global fight for one day when all of us can be free. For others who are losing hope, you know, and they're wondering when will things change, they already are. They're changing right now.
And the only question that is left unanswered is, what will your impact be outside of the ballot box?